Job chapter 17. I don't know about your Bible. My Bible has little headings sometimes at the beginning of chapters. Sometimes it breaks in the chapters. This one is Job praying for relief. We've already know that he's faced down Eliphaz again for the second time. We've gotten into this routine of calling each other uh, basically windbags at the beginning of their arguments always. And on both sides, Job's losing some of his patience with his so-called friends. And, uh, and, and kind of even insinuates in, in some of this we'll look at tonight that, you know, with friends like them who needs enemies. So <laughs> it, it's, uh, it's, it's kind of, I don't know if you've ever watched two old guys that aren't, aren't really going to be ready to go to blows, but they'll argue over anything. And it's kind of fun to watch them go back and forth. And, and, uh, so it, this is kind of, it, there's a little, a little comedy in all this. I'm glad we can find some comedy in all this. It's not intended to be funny, but you know, on this side of it, we sit back, we watch them call each other names and that's a little hilarious. And it may be a little comforting for us because, you know, maybe we don't call people names, but certainly we have them floating around in our minds sometimes, uh, toward people. So, um, we're in the middle of, of Job's, uh, response to Eliphaz, uh, Remember, he got into this um, section that it, he seemed to go into a prophetic statements about Jesus and, and even repeating some of the things that would be said or observances of his on the cross being struck on the cheek. We haven't had any record here of, of these guys actually hitting Job, but it could be figurative as far as their words just kind of smacking him in the face. You've you probably had that experience where somebody you don't expect to just kind of all of a sudden tears into you and it takes you aback. And maybe that's what he's talking about. But he's talking about them with their shaking their heads and their mouths gaping open. And I, I believe the, the description that we find in the Psalms is very similar to that. And we look at that as a messianic prophecy. And I, I think Job is that. In fact... Um, James calls Job a prophet. So when we get into James chapter five, we'll see that he looks at Job as one of the prophets. And uh, so it, it's aspects of that. And, and some of what we'll hopefully get to tonight if we get to chapter 19, uh, more prophetic statements of Job uh, toward the second coming of Christ. So uh, good stuff tonight. And, and and last week. So, anyways, uh, as always, I guess I shouldn't limit it to one or two nights. But it's, it's this book, I don't know about you guys, but this book, and, and I think I've said this every Wednesday night when we get into a new book, sometimes into the middle of it anyways. But this book is really kind of doing something with my head and my heart. I'm just, I'm looking at this because I'm not just reading through it. I'm looking at this in a whole different, in a different light. But I'm understanding much deeper some things, and it's kind of changing. I can feel it changing me. I don't know, it's not changing anything doctrinally. It's not changing anything really. I can't say it's changing the way I think as much. It's just my eyes are opening up to more things, I guess. I don't even know how to explain it. I just know there's something going on in me as we get through this book. So um, it's my new favorite because it happens to be where we're at. So. Uh, anyhow, chapter 17, verse 1 says, My spirit is broken, my days are extinguished, the grave is ready for me. Are not mockers with me, and does not my eye dwell on the provocation? All right, so he's being depressed, right? We, we've talked about this cycle. He kind of goes through, he gets very down, very depressed. And then all of a sudden he comes back up like we'll see in chapter 19. And then he kind of, you know, gets back into the moment that he's living in. And he kind of goes right back now. So that's... That's part of this. He's just, he's emotionally spent, obviously physically spent, but uh, emotionally, spiritually spent on this whole thing, trying to keep up. It's one thing to be sick and try to survive and try to, to overcome an illness. And, and you have in yourself your own, your own mind going, did I do something to deserve this? Or why is God letting this happen? And, and that's going on inside yourself. But then to have to contend with people on top of that would just wear you down. 
more than just the illness on its own. So that's where he's at. You know, the, his spirit's broken. He sees the end very near for him. The grave is ready for me. Are not mockers with me? So his friends are of no use to him. They're just they're just adding to it. They're like pushing him into the grave as far as he's concerned. And does not my eye dwell on the provocation? He, I, I can't even think about anything else. I can't think about recovery. I can't think about treating myself because I have to think about their arguments and what they're saying to me. I can't. I can't even get my mind off of this. Now put down a pledge for me with yourself. Who is he who will shake hands with me? So who's going to do business with me? This is where I'm at. As you read through this and in his depressive parts, you start seeing how this has affected his life in many different ways. We've talked about his wife and that relationship and and not just, you know, having her come and say, hey, why don't you just curse God and die and get this over with? But having to be able to watch how this is tormenting her and not be able to do anything about it. Now he's got these friends who are not really great friends. And there's other realizations. He's just thinking about every aspect of life. Who would do business with me now? Who would, who would even touch me to shake my hand for a business deal? You know, it says, for you have, for you have hidden their heart from understanding. Therefore, you will not, or you will not exalt them. He who speaks flattery to his friends, even the eyes of, of his children fail or will fail. But he who, or, but he has made me a byword of, of the people. And I have become one uh, in whose face men spit. So. It's just a byword, and and you can almost say this is getting to be prophetic. In speaking of Jesus again, his his name Job is my name is just a byword. Even today, some have pointed out that even today we'll talk about the patience of Job, without really going into the expression, or or without going into his life. If we say that, and and talking about it any more than just saying you know he lost everything and then he was sick for a long time then he had horrible friends and then in the end everything gets restored but he had to wait we don't know how long he had to wait we don't know he never knew why so there's just the patience of job wouldn't <laughs> actually if you read through this job's patience is really just on the line here just on the wire but anyhow we, we talk about that and enduring like job or or, or whatever but we don't really think about him, and we don't think about his wife if we're just mentioning him in a, in a passing. Well, his name has just gotten common. His name is just, you know, he's that guy out on the, on the ash heap who wants to be like Job, who wants to, you know, no longer, hey, let's go see Job. Hey, let's go get counsel of Job. Let's, now it's just, who wants to be like that? I'm not going out there to that. Anyway, so he who speaks uh, flattery to his friends, even the eyes of the children will fail, but I'm sorry, but he has made me a byword of the people. Oh, and where I was going with that with Jesus is you got people out there who will attach his name to a curse. He and they don't know anything about him. The only thing they know about Jesus is that it goes with curse words. They don't, they don't know any of the stories. They don't know that he died for their sins. They don't nothing. And his, his name is just thrown out. Like it's nothing. And I've become one who, who, in whose face men spit. We know that that happened to Jesus. My eyes, or my eye has grown dim because of sorrow. I think he's just, he, again, he's emotionally spent. He's weeping. Again, he says his spirit is broken. Uh, all my members are like shadows. So he's basically just, he's not even physically the man he used to be. Upright men are astonished at this. And the innocent stir himself up against the hypocrite. Yet the righteous will hold to his way. And he who has clean hands will be stronger and stronger. I'm not exactly sure about this except for the, to say just taking it like this right now. He's talking about upright men looking at Job being astonished. And maybe upright men looking at Jesus and being astonished. Again, if we're still in that, this whole section is prophetic. Then upright men being astonished at it. 
the innocent stir himself up against the hypocrite? You know, maybe maybe there are people in Job's life that are hearing some of the interchange, some of the the argument back and forth, and are willing to kind of are thinking about should I say something in his defense? Yet the righteous will hold to his way, and he who has clean hands will be stronger and stronger. If you are a, a Christian, I'm just going to say, if you're a Christian, you read this story and you, and you spend any time in it, and you don't come away with any more strength of spirit and any more strength or determination in your life to hold on to your faith, no matter what, then I, I don't know what you're looking at. We should all come away from this. There's a reason why it's here. It is to encourage us to to press on. It's encourages is to encourage us to to not give up and not to let uh, the accusers destroy our faith or even our reasoning of our faith. <clears throat> uh, but please come back again, all of you, for I shall not find one wise man among you. <laughs> so now he's talking to his friends again. There, there's not a single there's not a single man among you that has any wisdom at all they they just stood up other thing was Eliphaz and said are we not older than your father you owe us respect because of our wisdom of our days because of the number of our days and he said there's not a wise man among you so he's kind of answering that my days are past my purposes are broken off even thoughts of my even the thoughts of my heart, they change uh, the night to d into day. The light is near. They say that the face, or they say in the face of darkness. If I wait for the grave uh, as my house, if I make my bed in darkness, if I say to corruption, you are my father, and to the worm, you are my mother <clears throat> and my sister, where then is my hope? As for my hope, who can see it? Will they go down to the gates of Sheol? Uh, shall we have rest together in the dust? Right, so, um, he just he thinks this is this is the end. I'm not going to get back to where I was before. Everything's gone. The influence is gone. The, so basically, the value of my life is nothing now my purposes are, are broken off i don't have any purpose left here there, nobody wants to talk to me nobody's seeking counsel to me nobody thinks that i have any wisdom in me including my friends uh even the thoughts of my heart you know right? they change the night into day <clears throat> the light is near they say in the face of darkness you know it's almost like there's an it, He's trying to acknowledge that, you know, you guys are saying that if I will confess some secret sin that I have, everything will come back. I don't know what you're talking about. There's nothing left in me. There's nothing that I know, and we'll see that again. There's nothing that I know that I've done. And so all I see is the end. I don't see me coming back from this. I don't see me, you know, going back to what I was. Um, if I say to corruption, you are my father, uh, uh, and to the worm, you are my mother and my sister. This condition of my body, the things, the sores, the worms that I'm infested with, all that stuff that's making me gross to everybody is a better family than my three friends that are sitting here. You know, their words, their encouragement, so to speak, is, is nothing. Um, anyhow, so chapter 8. Bildad can't stand it, so now he's got to speak up again. It says, then Bildad the Shuhite answered and said, how long till you put an end to words? There it is again. You, you blow hard. You bag of wind. How long before you be quiet? Gain understanding and afterward we will speak. Why are we counted as beasts? Remember he said something about that a chapter or two back about the beast being able to give better counsel or something than his own friends uh, and regard it as stupid in your sight uh, so you don't have any guard, regard for our wisdom anything that we say uh, you who tear yourself in anger 
Shall the earth be forsaken for you, and shall the rocks, or shall the rock be removed from its place? So, what's going to change for you? Everything needs to change for you. The way everything is made needs to change for you, Job. Who do you think you are? Kind of, you know. The light of the wicked indeed goes out, and the flame of his fire does not shine. Now, remember the first time he went around here, he kind of corrected Eliphaz in some things because Eliphaz had said, You lost your kids because of your sin. Bildad comes up and says, no, if the Lord if the Lord took your kids, it's because of something they did, not you. He understood that premise of, you know, the kids don't pay for the sins of the father and the father for the kids. But, um, and so now here, it seems like he's agreeing with, with Job. Yep, your light's about to go out, dude. You're, you're done. So the light is dark in his tent. And his lamp beside uh, beside him is put out. The steps of his strength are shortened, and his own counsel cast him down. For he is cast into a net by his own feet, and he walks into a snare. And the net takes him by the heel, and the snare lays, ho lays hold of him. The noose is hidden for him on the ground, and a trap for him uh, in the road. So... Basically, all of that to say your own words are trapping you. You're, all, you're getting caught up in, in your words and in your justification of what you've done or your denial that you've done anything. And, and all of this throwing accusation at us and contending with us is just getting you caught deeper and deeper into your trap. Terrors frighten him on every side and drive him to his... Uh, and drive him to his feet. So paranoia is setting in. Job, you're paranoid. You you think we're out to get you. You think we're, you know, everybody's out to get you. Um, his strength is starved and destruction is ready at his side. It devours patches of his skin. Uh, the firstborn of death devours his limbs. He is uprooted from the shelter of his tent. And it, the tent, this is like the second time, at least in, in this chapter alone, that we've seen tent. And it may be a reference to his body. Remember, <clears throat> uh, even in John, John refers to um, the Lord coming and tabernacling with us or tenting, pitching his tent with us in John chapter 1. And it was often a reference to uh, the body. Um, trying to think, there's another reference about that, putting off this this tent, putting in putting on a new a new body um <clears throat> but anyhow it may be just a reference a, a poetic and this is considered a poetic book but a poetic reference to his body um, which maybe gives a little more clarification as to what he's talking about um, anyways he is uprooted from the shelter of his tent uh, and they parade him before the king of terrors they dwell in his tent uh, who are none of his Brimstone is scattered in, on his dwelling. His roots are dried out below. And his branch withers above. Um, I'm going to keep going before I comment here, I guess. Uh, the memory of him perishes from the earth, and he has no name among the renowned. Uh, he is driven from light into darkness and and chased out of the world. He has neither son nor posterity among his people, nor any remaining in his dwellings. Those in the in the west are astonished at his day, and those in the east are frightened. Surely such are the uh, dwellings of the wicked, and this is the place of him who does not know God. Personally, I think here he's telling Job, you're going to hell. He's condemned Job to hell he's basically accusing him of not really knowing god um he talks about you know the the deterioration of his body the firstborn of death devours his limbs he is uprooted from the shelter of his tent from his body and they parade him before the king of terrors they dwell in his tent who are none of his it almost sounds like he's saying dude you are possessed You're, you're possessed by something. You're being paraded before the king of terrors. Those who dwell in your tent aren't even 
aren't even you. They're not even from you. And so if you're taking tent to mean his body, they dwell in his tent who are none of his. Brimstone is scattered on his dwelling, and his roots are dried out below. You're out of your mind. You're, 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 at least at, you're at least acting like if not possessed by by spirits by demons. Um. Yeah, I mean this guy is just there's no, nothing nice about Bildad. Nothing at all nice about him. His branch withers, his memory of him perishes on the earth, and his his name is, uh, and he has no name among the renowned. No. I don't know about y'all, but I don't ever think of Bildad unless I'm reading this story. But Job is mentioned throughout the Bible a couple of different times, and even in the New Testament. So, <laughs> who's lasted? You know, I don't, I don't even know, to be honest with you, where a shoe height came from. I, I just don't. I don't. I don't. I don't know. I have not looked it up. I've not researched that out. But just you know. But I know who Job is, and I go to look to Job for strength. So his words, well, he's accusing Job of his words entrapping him. And the words of these three guys are entrapping them. It really is. Their accusation is coming back on them. And uh, it's proving out to be. Anyways, he's driven from light to darkness, chased out of the world. He has neither son nor posterity among his people. Well, who says that to somebody who lost 10 kids? You know? Yeah. Nor any remaining in his dwellings. Those who those in the west are astonished at his day and those in the east are frightened. Surely such are the dwellings of the wicked. And this is the place of him who does not know God. He, he's doing nothing but throwing condemnation to him and and judging him in a way that shouldn't be. You know, today people like to throw out Jesus' words of judge not lest you be judged. Which I don't even know if they know what version of the Bible that comes from. They just like to throw it out there. And they're talking about, they're saying, you, you can't judge me and my sin and my way of life. If you do that, you'll be judged. Well, I'm not saying, you know, I'm not the one sending you to hell. I'm trying to tell you how to get away from it. If what you're doing is sin, it's sin, and, and you need to deal with that. If you want a relationship with God, you cannot stay here and move to there, you know, or, or be there. Have both. You can't have both. You can't, you can't be friends with the world and friends with God at the same time. You can't have a close relationship with both because it doesn't work that way. You're going to serve your ma you're going to serve one master. You can't serve two masters. Another word of Jesus. Um, so, <clears throat> and now I don't even know where I was going with that. But anyways, um, but here you got a guy saying, "I don't know what you did. There's no evidence other than you're sick and you lost everything. There's no evidence that." you are separated yourself from God. There's no evidence of sin. There's, there's nobody accusing Job. Hey, he did this to me. N nobody's coming from any of the dealings that Job had and saying he mistreated me. He, he had a dirty dealing with me. He did none of that. And yet his friends are insisting he's done something. And therefore... This guy's saying, you don't know God. If you knew God, none of this would happen to you. If you had a relationship with him, if you really meant it when you did the sacrifices, if you really, if it was really in your heart, this was all a show, Job. None of this was real, ever. You don't really know God. You know, we have to be really careful about that. Now, if you know people who are obviously living in sin, they're addicted to something. They are full on, unashamedly practicing sin. We know, the Bible tells us, if you're doing that, if that is your way of life and you've justified it somehow, 
then you don't have any inheritance in the kingdom. You, you don't know God. But we can sit back and watch that person crash and be the first ones to come in when everybody else abandons them and say, listen, I don't care about your sin. I don't, I don't care about all that. You can get rid of that. That's between you and Jesus. Let's pray now. Ask him to forgive you. I'm not saying he's going to restore. He's not going to restore any of that to you because that was all wicked and against him. But let's see what kind of new life he's going to give you. Cry out to him. If all we do is say, Psh, done with you. Not, I'm not going to. I don't want you to, to. We walk a fine line, don't we? There's a. Actions that condone what they do, and there's there's still being involved in a person's life enough so that you have contact with them so they can see that you don't hate them in spite of whether they buy into the world's ideology of if you disagree with me, you hate me. Maybe they do that and they cut you off. I don't know. But you keep tabs on them, and when the world finally abandons them and they're just left there alone, be the one that goes in and say, listen, I have the answer. And and not, I'm not saying they're going to accept it. There's many people who on their deathbed still curse God. I think it's Stalin, they say, sat up in his bed and shook his fist at heaven and, 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 and just, I don't know if he spoke out against heaven or not, if he could even speak. But they say he sat up in his bed, he shook his fist in anger at heaven, and then died. So some people will go to their last breath, and it'll be against God. That's just, we can't do anything about that. But we can talk to people. We can even talk to people who are not being responsive. If you know somebody who's in a coma, Why not go and whisper to them? Because you hear stories all the time of people waking up after having been in a coma for a long time and they knew everything that was happening around them, even though they couldn't respond to it. They knew when people were there. They knew what, what doctors did. They knew that they were hungry and nobody was feeding them. You know, they, they know when they wake up. You know, to go to a car accident and and be there with somebody for their last few minutes of their life and just try to pray with them and, and just tell them, listen, if you'll cry out to the Lord even now. You know? <laughs> Pancho Juarez talks a, told a story about that. He got called to the hospital and this old guy's in the, in the bed. He'd been angry with God and, and uh, <laughs> he knew the story. He knew the guy didn't didn't want to be a believer, had rejected God all of his life. He goes there, he says, you know, right, I'll, I'll go. He wasn't even really, had, didn't even really have his heart into it. He says, went, shared the gospel, prayed with the guy, and, and walked out, and, and the guy accepts Jesus right before he dies. I mean, like, pff, dies while he's there, if, if I remember it. He comes out, he's getting on the elevator when he's going home, and he's like, that's not even fair. He's like, I walked out. I was angry because the guy got saved. He says, that's, that's a bad heart. That's a bad heart. And, uh, huh? Jonah, right, exactly, Jonah. Yeah, there's the greatest example of a bad heart right there. Proclaim the words of the Lord. An entire city of probably some guess up to a couple million people. Convert, give their heart, give over to the Lord. He goes out to watch the destruction happen, and when nothing happens, he gets angry. Perfect example of that. We don't, we don't want to turn around and go from Job's position to that position. So, so we don't do that. But anyhow, this guy has just been, he, he couldn't have hurt Job anymore, I don't think, if he'd have actually picked up a rock and chucked it at him. You know, just... <laughs> yes, I know. You know, I tried that joke with the youth group a couple weeks ago, the whole Bill Dad being the shortest person in the Bible because he's only a shoe height, and they didn't get it. I had to, I had to tell it twice. I had to 
just kind of force it back out there before even the other adults in the room got it. I'm like, you know what? I'm done stealing Calvary Chapel jokes. Anyhow, maybe it was in the delivery. So, Bill Dad can't stand Job speaking, so he butts in, calls him a windbag. Job's not going to take this. <laughs> then Job answered, or you could put in there interrupted, and said, how long will you torment my soul and break me in pieces with words? And these guys are just, that's a nice way of saying, just shut up, dude. And the word break there is crush. That's what I'm saying. If Bildad had actually picked up a rock and thrown it at him, he couldn't have hurt Job more. These are supposed to be friends, at least friends of the family, you know. These are people he looked up to. They, they were his elder. They were older than him. These ten times you have reproached me. You, have not ashamed, or you are not ashamed that you have wronged me. You're not ashamed because you don't even know what you're doing, right? And if indeed I have erred, my error remains with me. Right? So he's saying, listen, if I've committed some kind of sin, it's in me. I don't even know what's going on. It stays with me. I, the, one, it's not between you and me. This is between me and God. Two, I don't even know what it is. I don't know. And remember when we were going through the law, you had, um, you had trespasses and you had sin. So you had a trespass offering, you had a sin offering. And remember, the sin offering was a willing act. You knew what you were doing. The trespass offering was for a sin committed that you didn't know you'd done, or you didn't know you had done, or you weren't aware that it was happening, or you know, you, it, it wasn't something that was um, premeditated. The sin itself, for, the sin offering was for sins that were premeditated, basically. Trespass offerings were for things whether they were out of reactions or 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 accidents or whatever you didn't you didn't do them on purpose so um and i think that's what job is kind of describing here I, if i if if indeed i have erred basically my error remains with me because i don't even know what it was i don't know what i did which you know now we know job sacrificed for this very reason he sacrificed and prayed for his kids just in case they had done something wrong and didn't realize it. So certainly he would have done the same for himself. You know, I don't, I don't see Job just kind of scooting by here with, with you know, no confession of anything he had done that he knew about and also praying god if i've if i've left anything out if i've forgotten anything or if i've done something that i'm not aware of please forgive me i'm sure job prayed that for himself he was already doing it for his kids certainly so the fact that he would pray for himself would make him aware that his kids might need that too so he he, he does it for them not because they're bad kids he didn't sacrifice for his kids just purely because they were bad kids and drunk all the time and partied all the time I remember growing up, I kind of got that inclination from them. But if you remember when we go, when we went back there, when we first started the book, we talked about the fact that this was a pretty righteous family. They looked out for each other. They included each other. The brothers took care of the sisters. This was a righteous bunch of kids following their righteous father. He was the priest of the home. He made sacrifices and prayers and and it sounds like extra just in case somebody did something and they don't remember it or they didn't weren't aware of it. So certainly, you know, he can say here without it being a, an attempt to justify something, if I've done something, I'm not aware of it. And I've tried to tell you guys that and you're not listening to me, right? Uh, verse 5, if indeed you exalt yourselves against me and plead my disgrace against me, know then that God has wronged me and that and has surrounded me with his net. Right? Now, is that an accusation against God by Job? Or is it just a realization that of the same thing he told his wife? I don't just take the good from God. I take the adversity from God too. And, and knows in his spirit that this is from God. God has let this happen. 
says, if I cry out concerning wrong, I am not heard. If I cry aloud, there is no justice. He has fenced me, he has fenced up my way, so I cannot pass. He has set darkness in my path. He has stripped me of my glory and taken the crown from my head. He breaks me down on every side, and I am gone. My hope, he is uprooted like a tree. He has also kindled his wrath against me, and he counts me as one of his enemies. His troops uh, come together and build up their road against me. They encamp all around my tent. Right? So basically, they, God has besieged me. He surrounded me. I can't move. I can't. I can't get my own supplies. He's not supplying me, for whatever reason. All I know is God is against me right now. He has allowed all of this to happen, which is <laughs> still a, a a hard thing and can be taken as an accusation against God. Well, really, I think Job's just saying here. I, I know God's still in control of this. I don't know why all the bad things are here. But I know he's still the one that's in control of all this. And I don't know why it's happening to me, but he's the one that's still in control of all of this. And I think sometimes from a negative position like that, that's all we got. I, I don't know why. You know, Martha and Mary, come out to Jesus. If you had been here, this, my brother, would be alive. And Jesus walks him through the whole thing. Probably had a, we don't get as much detail of his conversation with Mary, but I imagine it was probably pretty similar to Martha's. And, and just walks her down to, I know you are the Christ who's coming to the world. That's all I know right now. That's all that I'm absolutely sure of right now. And I think that's Job is where he's at. I just know God is God. And I don't know why this is happening, and I don't know what I did or if I did, and I don't think I did. But I know he's still in control of this. This is, this is him in my life right now. He has removed my brothers far from me, and my acquaintances are completely estranged from me. My relatives have failed, and my close friends have forgotten me. Those who dwell in my, in my house and my, and my maidservants... Count me as a stranger. I am an alien in their sight. I call my servant, but he gives no answer. I beg him with my mouth. My breath is offensive to my wife, and I am repulsive to the children of my own body. Even young children despise me. Now we know his children are, are dead. He doesn't have any kids left. Um. Maybe some argument about whether he had kids that were gone, but it seems like even the 10 kids who died were already adults, so they weren't like under his house or anything, so, or under his roof. But basically, everybody I know, everybody who was close to me, everybody that I took care of in the past, they've all abandoned me. My kids are gone. My, my breath is offensive to my wife. And I don't know if she's not coming out to talk to him anymore. You know, I mean, her, her, the last and really only recorded words we have of her are curse God and die. And his response to that is, you speak foolishly, should we only take, you know, the good and not the adversity from God? Well, evidently, maybe, maybe this is a reference to her being offended by that. Maybe it's just everything about him is repulsive physically. <laughs> And, and certainly his breath is not any better if he's got all of this other on the outside of him is, is bad. What's going on on the inside is not any better. And <clears throat> um, But, you know, his servants won't come to him anymore. The ones that he took care of are act like they don't know him. Verse 18 says, even young children despise me. I arise and they speak against me. So even the little, even the kids are, are are against me. Imagine the kids hearing about Job and sneaking out to this ash heap, this dump outside of of the community, and just to get a peek at the gross 
person that's living out there that nobody wants to talk to, nobody wants to touch, and I, I can't believe it, so I just got to go see it for myself. You know, right. Uh, I get the impression that's kind of what's going on. And when he gets up, they speak against him. They probably just call him names, right? That all my close friends have whored me, and those whom I love have turned against me. My bone clings to my skin and to my flesh. So he's, he, he's not maintaining his weight. And I have escaped by the skin of my teeth. Have pity on me. Have pity on me. O oh, you, my friends, for the hand of God has struck me. But things get bad. Things don't go the way you want them. And uh, you hope your friends are going to stand with you. You know, you you hope you're not going to get friends who are going to just start accusing you of all kinds of things or who are going to just abandon you. Uh, you know, I can't, I can't be a part of this. I can't do this. I can't be with this. Um, I can remember when I found out my mom and dad were going to get divorced. And the next time I was at church, my best friend followed me into the bathroom. And so at that time I'm like, 13, 14 years old, follows me into the bathroom and says, hey, I heard your mom and dad are getting divorced. I said, yep. He says, yeah, I can't talk about that. Turned around and walked out. Similar situations, you guys know our thing without going into a lot of details because it's being recorded, but you know what we went through a few years ago? You know, with, with Noah. And we had that kind of reaction from friends, from family. But I'm looking at the ones who, even when you didn't understand it, you stood there anyways. You know? And you guys prayed for us, and you guys lifted us up, and you guys helped in any way you could. And there's some others who aren't here tonight who are, in a, you know, a part of that. And, um, you know, I, I, I didn't have to be here where everybody left, where Anybody who didn't, just for not understanding the situation, didn't want to be a part of the situation, didn't want to know anything about the situation. It was enough for them to know we were okay, but that was all they needed to know. They didn't need to know anything else, didn't want to know anything else, didn't want to talk about it. Still don't want to talk about it, some of them. You know, and, uh, and, and you know, it, I, I'm not going to, I'm not going to force details on anybody about that whole deal because it's not a pleasant thing to talk about. I don't want to talk about it most of the time. You know, it, w it was enough to have short interchanges with some of you to just say, hey, how are you guys doing? It's been a good week or it's been a bad week. And that was all you needed to know sometimes. And sometimes I needed to get some details out and you guys stood there and you took it. And sometimes I didn't need to. And you were okay with that too. And probably, probably happy I didn't. <laughs> I didn't. But, you know, you walked through it with us and, and I didn't have to be here. There were, there were days when I felt like this because of other people who were supposed to be close that decided they weren't really and couldn't walk through it. But I didn't have to look very far to get past my Bildad and my Eliphaz and, and Zophar. You know, I didn't have to look very far to get away from that. So thank you. Uh, you guys were doing that with us and going through that with us. But I can't... Uh, you know, it, it, where he's at is very lonely. It's very, uh, it's hard enough to, to, to be going, why has God given this to me to walk through? Why has he put me in this position? Why? And then to know that nobody else is willing to walk through it with you. But at the same time, you still know God's there. You know, and, and you still... You know you're not completely alone. And and to be honest with you, we have a better understanding of that. I mean, we're going to see that Job had a great understanding of who who God was. And, and we're getting ready to get into this section of him looking for his Redeemer and all. But he didn't have even the writings of Moses to look at. He didn't have the Torah. He didn't, he didn't have the prophets. He didn't have the Psalms. He didn't have the New Testament. He didn't have the cross. He didn't have, he didn't have any of that. And... And while we can look here and see Job certainly had the Holy Spirit in him or he wouldn't speak some of the words that he that he spoke, 
he didn't have the same understanding that we have. And and so we have that benefit on this side of the cross to to really know we're not really ever all alone. Anyways, so why do you persecute me as God does and are not satisfied with my flesh? You know, my suffering is not enough for you guys. Uh, Oh, that my words were written. Oh, that they were inscribed in a book. That they were engraved on a rock with an iron pen and lead forever. So I I don't know if that means that, you know, there was some kind of practice they had back then where they would engrave things into a rock and then fill it with lead so, you know, you could see clearly what was engraved in there or or what the deal was. But, um, you know, little did he know, all these thousands of years later, it is written in a book. It is there for us to, to know and to hear and to understand. He wanted to pass on what he was going through for the generations to come. He wanted the words and what God was doing through him, in him, whatever, to be passed on. And, and I think inspired because here is the realization that Job has of who God is. Greater than anything anybody else in this book has spoken so far as far as Bildad and Zophar and and, um, and Eliphaz for sure. But um, again, they've all had some truth, but not solid truth. They've, they've had some truth. But they misrepresent God even with their truth. So this is the great thing. No matter what we ever go through, and as long as we ever feel, this is where we need to go to. He says, for I know that my Redeemer lives, and he shall stand at last on the earth. And after my skin is destroyed, this I know, that in my flesh I shall see, I shall see God, whom I shall see for myself, and my eyes shall behold and not another how my heart yearns within me. If you should say, how shall we persecute him since the root of the matter is found in me? Be afraid of the sword for yourselves, for wrath brings the punishment of the sword that you may know there is a judgment. That's both an amazing realization of who God is, one that he needed a redeemer, so Job, Job knows, listen, I'm fallen. I need to be redeemed. He wouldn't have the book of Ruth to understand the Goel, the, the Redeemer like we do. Maybe not fully understand what Messiah was going to do, but it's certainly looking toward that. I know that my Redeemer lives. Right now, as far as Job is concerned, he lives. And he shall stand at last on the earth. Now, this is Job talking about the second coming of Christ. And whether he knew that, that this was a second coming, or or whether he just knew Messiah was coming, period, and he kind of lumped it, which sometimes you see in the Old Testament, just as understanding, he's coming. And in their prophecies, they may speak of things that are concerning his first coming and his second coming. But whether they understood that or not, we were not absolutely sure. In fact, probably just assume that it was all encompassing his coming. Because that's what the Pharisees taught. That's what the disciples right up to the cross are arguing about the fact that, you know, when he sets up his kingdom, I'm going to have this position. No, I'm going to have that position. You're going to be over here, you know. Who's going to have what? They were still looking for him then to set up his kingdom. It wasn't until after the day of Pentecost when the Holy Spirit came on him and they understood for sure that he was coming back. So he he knows. He knows his Redeemer lives and that he's going to stand on the earth. Um. And after my skin is destroyed. So he knows he's going to die. He understands. It's appointed once for man to die. I know, right? Or where am I here? And after my skin is destroyed, this I know that in my flesh I'll see God. 
he knows resurrection. That in my flesh I shall, see, I shall see God, whom I shall see for myself, and my eyes shall behold and not another, how my heart yearns within me. He has the same attitude we have. Right? How many times a week do you think, Lord, if you would just come back, it, 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 I would. Whatever's left on my bucket list, I don't care about. You just, you just show up. You know, some days, it's, it's on the good days, we're like, Lord, man, it'd be so cool if you just showed up. On the bad days, it's like, Lord, why are you putting this off? Just show up, <laughs> you know. But, but it's because in our hearts, we're like, we're looking for that day. We're looking for that day. Um, and he understood, and he's telling these guys who are accusing him, and Bildad just ended that, talking, accusing him of not knowing God. And it, this comes on him, I think, being filled with the Spirit, God speaking through him, saying, and assuring him, you know me, you do know me, and you know more about me than these guys do. I got this Bible I rescued from a garage sale last summer. It's called an American translation. Now, I don't know if this is a, a paraphrase. Uh, it, it claims to not be. I don't know how accurate everything is in it. I haven't really looked at it or researched it too much. In fact, <clears throat> I picked this up for just like two bucks a summer. And then my great grandpa, I get his, my mom gave me his Bible this, when I went to Georgia a couple months ago or last month and uh, in January. Um, and, and she gives me his Bible, and it's the same version. It's this version. But anyways, I like how it puts this, how he words this, uh, the, the person who translated this. He says, I know my Redeemer lives, and I will, and will at last stand on the dust, which is the word there is, earth. Um, afterwards, my skin will surround this body, and in my flesh I will see God. It's just like he's picturing the regeneration of his of his body, and and we know from First Corinthians chapter fifteen, I think it is Paul talking about getting this new body, this new that too, right? That's kind of what Ezekiel sees in the Valley of Dry Bones. You're right. Just these bodies coming back together and being resurrected. Now that speaks of of Israel as a whole, but. Now you know it's not just a, a relationship just with God. Job had an understanding this was an individual relationship too. And I know I'm going to see that person. Um, and he finishes off that chapter with, if you should say, verse 28, if you should say, how shall we persecute, how shall we persecute him? How, how are we going to poke him more after this? How are we going to how are we going to beat on him some more, right? Since the root of the matter is found in me, be afraid of the sword for yourselves. For wrath brings the punishment of the sword that you may know there is a judgment. Now, if he's still speaking of the second coming, now he's looking past the resurrection and into that final the second coming when Jesus comes back and he gets to Armageddon in chapter 19 of Revelation says that the sword that proceeds from his mouth, that's what he uses to defeat the armies of the world. That wrath is coming, that, that judgment or punishment is coming with that sword to the nations of the world who gather against him. Now, I, I love, I mean, I knew of the sections, and, I, and again, I've read through this, so I've, it's not I've never read this before, but there's some things that, that just kind of get ingrained in you. Like, I know my Redeemer lives. I mean, we wrote so, we, we have songs about that verse. And, uh, and that he shall stand at last on the earth, and after my skin is destroyed. I, so I know, I knew going into this book, Job believed in the resurrection. He believed in redemption. He understood all of that. Um. <clears throat> but I didn't remember the rest of that where he talks about the punishment of God coming too. And all those who put themselves or misrepresent God. 
are going to face that. And Jude talks about it. If you want to get to the misrepresenting of God part, Jude talks about false teachers and false uh, uh, apostles and, and whatnot that were going to come. And and Paul warns about them with, who will have just enough truth to tickle their itching ears. Just going to tell them what they want to know. There'll be a little bit of truth, but most of it will be a lie or a misrepresentation of the truth. Jude warns about that, saying that they're, they are reserved for judgment in the last day. All of that. Now, I I hear, and I I maybe hear a little more now because we spend so much time, uh, you know, at least two days, two Sunday evenings a month, excuse me, talking about prophecies, talking about end time stuff. Listen, I grew up, thankfully, in the churches I grew up with, I grew up with pastors who weren't afraid to talk about it. And weren't afraid to teach on it. I hear all the time of, of people who grew up in churches never heard about the rapture, never heard about the return. The pastors never taught revelation. And I, I don't, I don't think I necessarily ever heard anybody teach all the way through revelation until I came to Calvary Chapel. I did once with a youth group. They wanted to know because I mean, if you ask a youth group. What book do you want to say? We're going to study one book of the Bible. Which one do you want to do? Revelation. Everybody wants to do Revelation first. I made them sit through John first. <laughs> and then we would, then we did Revelation. But because, you know, they, they like the scary stuff and they like to be scared. And then they get in there and they find out it's really not that scary because you have that blessing at the beginning of the book that says, hey, if you read and understand, you know. But there's a big push right now, even within Calvary Chapels for us to not talk about that anymore. And to to put it on the back burner, to only address it if you only if you come up on on a verse here or there of the end times, but not to spend a lot of time on it, kind of getting away from prophecy conferences and and all of that or or mocking I mean the one that Jan Markell does, they have that's the biggest one I think they say in the biggest response. And her her biggest thing that she talks about is people coming up to her or emailing her or messengers saying our church doesn't teach this stuff anymore our church won't teach this stuff at all they won't go near it where do we find a church that will talk about prophecy and talk about the end times and and yet you have also the people who mock what she does there and and what Jack Hibbs does and what Tom Hughes does and and so and, and, and like I said it's even coming some within Calvary Chapel um, I've I've been kind of warned out of the side of some mouths here of other pastors of you can't can't get on that too much because you know you don't want to be known for one thing. Well, I mean that's not the only thing we talk about. First of all, and and second of all, you know, I understand you don't want to be numbered with the the crazies, and and certainly there are a lot of wackos out there who want to talk about end time stuff that has nothing to do with the Bible. And they want to, you know, they're afraid of jumping into that camp. We don't want to do that. And, and I don't want to do that. I, I listened to, um, they posted it on Hope for Hope for Our Times, Tom Hughes' uh, uh, um, YouTube page. But it was, he had gone on David Reagan's show and been interviewed on there. And that was one of the things they talked about was, um, people staying away from it because they don't want to be considered, you know, one of the crazies, whatever, or, and and really, you know, encouraging people to not and pastors to not talk about it anymore. Um, it's usually out of ignorance, I think. One, and they keep pointing this out: most seminaries don't teach Bible prophecy anymore. They don't talk about the end times anymore. There are even some that have come out that are mainline Protestant denominations, their seminaries teach Jesus not even coming back. So it, it, it's just, it, it's really very disheartening. I heard going down the road yesterday, listening to a guy that I, I really like, man, he's a great Bible teacher. He starts talking in eschatology and talking about and explaining how the church has replaced Israel. I'm like, you got to be kidding me. Bloop, gone. I'm like, you can't do that. I mean, you can, 
but and I and I get it, and I hope he's just wrong and just and not a, a false teacher. But you know, I don't know. There's things he's part of a denomination. Now, there's some things that they do, like infant baptism and stuff. And I'm like, you know, that's. I just couldn't stand to listen to it. So, anyhow, um, the problem with that is, and and just one because we're recording and and. I know it's getting late. This is all stuff you guys probably already know, but so I'm just going to go through it real quick. But the second coming of Christ, as far as the New Testament is concerned, is one of the broadest subjects that's talked about in the New Testament. 260 chapters in the New Testament, and you put all the books of the New Testament together, and the second coming is mentioned in 216 of those chapters. Um, I, I read a thing yesterday. I just happened to to be going round about this because of a comment that was made to me a couple of weeks ago. And so I kind of looked to see how often the second coming is mentioned in the entire Bible. There are 150 chapters where more than half of the chapter is concerning the second coming of Jesus. More than half of the chapter. That doesn't include all the chapters that less than half of the chapter is dedicated to that. So 51% or more of the chapter is dedicated to the second coming of Christ. 23 of the 27 books, back to just the New Testament, 23 of the 27 books um, are, mention the second coming of Christ. All nine writers of the New Testament mention the second coming of Christ. Paul writes 13 New Testament books and speaks of the seven, second coming of Christ 50 times. In 13 books. Some estimate that one out of every 10 verses in the New Testament have to deal or deal with the second coming of Jesus. And some people say, well, you can't use it for new believers. It's not appropriate. You know, they wouldn't know. They wouldn't understand. They can't understand. But when you read Acts chapter 17, you find out that Paul was with the Thessalonican church for three Sabbaths before he was run out of town because of persecution or by persecution for three Sabbaths. When you read his letters to the Thessalonian church, he reminds them that he had explained all this to them already. Now, 1 Thessalonians, each chapter ends with a mention, a reference to the second coming of Jesus. Now, he didn't, we, he didn't have the chapter breaks, so he didn't write it like that. But where we've made the chapter breaks in that book, each one ends with a statement or a reference to the second coming of Christ. A church that he had only been with for three weeks. He even talks about how he had, he had told them beforehand about the Antichrist, about the rapture of the church. He already explained it to him when he was with him in three weeks. A church that he established in that three weeks and then had to leave town. They already had all of this information given to them. Brand new believers. So they can know. They can understand. Why would we not tell them the hope of our faith? Our hope is to be with him. Our hope is that he's coming back. Not that we hope he's coming back. But that our, our desire, our longing is the, for the day that he does. And it is called the blessed hope. His, his, from the resurrections to the rapture. Um, <clears throat> you know, it, it's important to us to know. It's important for us to share with people. It's important for them to have a reason. You know, um, sometimes I think we forget that when Paul, I think it's Paul, tells us that we need to be able to give a reason for, for why we believe what we believe. That is our reason. That's one of the reasons anyways, why we believe. And it's one of, it's the encompassing of our faith. And, and again, we know that if, if the resurrection's not true, then we don't have a resurrection. So if the resurrection of Jesus is not true, we don't have a resurrection in us. Paul says, we're, uh, if, if it's not true, if the resurrection is not true, we of all people are the most pathetic, the most pitiable of all. So don't be discouraged by it. 
Don't be afraid to tell people about Jesus and him coming back. Job, the oldest story in the Bible, mentioned the second coming of Jesus Christ. It was perfect timing for the things that I've been hearing and just some of the other teachings I've been listening to to kind of tie all that in. Um, I got those facts from Joe Fosh. He was, when I was listening to him on this section of scripture, and uh, and he pointed all of that out. <clears throat> I've had it written down before from different teachings, but that's just, don't don't shy away from it. You know he's coming back. Why would you hide that? You know, I mean, what's the point of getting saved if there's nothing else after this? If you don't have anything to look forward to. You know, it's not just going to heaven. You're not going to sit on a cloud and, and play a harp. There's a new heaven. There's a new earth. A new Jerusalem. A new way of life. A new life that never ends. So, you know, it, it's all coming. We should be encouraged by that, not discouraged by it, not scared of it, not scared of his second coming. The only ones, like Job said, the only ones who need to be afraid of that are the ones who oppose him and reject him now, before then. So there's a whole lot more we could say about it, and maybe someday we will soon, but we're just going to leave it there because we're already late. So let's pray. Father, thank you for your word. Lord, thank you for the understanding that you've given us of, uh, and the realization that we need a redeemer, that we are separated from you by our sin, that without your redemption, without your work on the cross, and without taking your grace, we are lost forever. Lord, thank you for that understanding. And Lord, thank you for giving us, um, something to look forward to the day that we see you on earth the day that we see you come back the day of our resurrection when we have a new body um, and we're completely in your presence uh, and lord i know we're in your presence always but to be able to look up and to see your face thank you for giving us that to look forward to any understanding of how it will happen. We don't know the day or the hour of the rapture. But Lord, when that tribulation time begins, we, we will know the day you come back. And Lord, somehow we look forward to all of it. I mean, certainly we look forward to being in your presence, to being free of this old body and putting on a new body. Um, Lord, we look forward to your glory and being able to worship you um, and to look at you. But Lord, we even look forward to, or I do anyways, the, the events that will take place, that have to take place to set up your kingdom. And then to take us to the new heaven and the new earth. I cannot wait. I long for those days. Thank you, Lord, for calling us to you and changing our lives and changing our destinations. In Jesus' name, amen.